Welcome everyone to AI Power Drupal, a new era for content creation and management. My name is Murray Woodman and today I'll be taking you through some of the advancements in AI and uh, what this means for Drupal and how we can integrate AI into our Drupal sites. Taking a, a quick look at uh, the agenda for today, I'll take you through some of the, uh, the main developments in AI uh, and also then go on to have a look at some integration approaches. We'll be showing you two approaches for how you can make use of these AI services. Um, the main uh, sort of part of the presentation will be around augmenting content and I'll be showing you a Drupal module we've developed which allows you to uh, plug in different services. And finally, we'll have a look at some takeaways for site owners, some practical approaches for how you might uh, go about this on your websites. Okay, so the world is changing. I guess that's a truism, but in the world of AI over the last 10 years, that certainly is the case. Um, AI services really have come to the forefront of uh, the public mind. Um, back in 2011, we had IBM Watson um, winning Jeopardy, beating the best human players using natural language processing. Uh, in 20, I've got to put the old glasses on. In 2015, AlphaGo from DeepMind uh, was able to beat um, the world's best Go players. Uh, Go at that point uh, had been considered, you know, an unsolvable problem for uh, computer uh, computers, and yet uh, AlphaGo was able to to beat the best players. Uh, in 2017, uh, AlphaGo was uh, metamorphosed into Alpha Zero, and Alpha Zero um, was taught to play chess. And in this case, uh, Alpha Zero was able to beat Stockfish, which was at the time the world's leading uh, computer engine. The amazing thing about this was that Alpha Zero was able to do this with just 24 hours of training. And it did this by training, uh, learning from the best uh, chess games, but also training against itself to iteratively improve and eventually you know, surpass 1,000 years of uh, human experience and learning, all in just 24 hours. And in 2020, uh, we've had the release of GPT-3 from OpenAI. Uh, GPT-3 is based on a large language model uh, where much of the world's content has been scraped and crawled, ingested, and a large language model has ensued. GPT-3 is able to produce textual content that is difficult to distinguish from that of a human. And at the time of its release, it did cause quite a bit of uh, disquiet or concern in the community because now suddenly we have, you know, potentially a machine-generated web, not just a human one. And what we'll see uh, later in the presentation is how we can incorporate GPT-3 uh, into Drupal. And most recently, we've had uh, DALI-2 another OpenAI um, release. You guys may have seen this. It's, it's been around for a few months, and you may have seen these kinds of images uh, flooding the internet. Uh, the incredible thing here is you can you know, give DALI a, uh, a textual description, and images will be generated. So you know, if you haven't given this a try, I, I highly recommend it. When I first saw this in action, my jaw dropped on the floor, and you know, I turned to my family and said, the world has changed, and really it has, uh, it has massive consequences for, for content uh, creators and, and artists, I believe. Okay, so there are some, some of the examples of what's happened over the last 10 years, but we've also seen you know, a lot of these services uh, become available on you know, the large cloud platforms out there. All of these different services are providing uh, many different APIs which allow you to access uh, AI services. And it's not just these, there are many more uh, as well. So once AI was for data scientists, a data scientist would, would get the, a data set and train up a model and then test and validate that. And that was an iterative process that really took a lot of know-how, uh, time, expense and expertise. But now with these new services, AI really is for a whole range of other people. It's for designers, artists and authors and people right across the enterprise as they uh, you know, uh, augment the content that they have and use AI to, to help them uh, do the jobs they need to do. It's also for developers as well. So we have these APIs out there. This allows us to incorporate into CMSs such as Drupal, and therefore it's for website owners as well. You and me, 
the people that want to actually uh, achieve things. So what does all this mean for Drupal? I'm glad you asked. Uh, firstly, let's take a composable approach. Um, I think we've really got to embrace all these services that are out there. We shouldn't consider them a threat. We shouldn't consider that we should be trying to replicate them inside Drupal. We should take a composable approach and look at the services that are out there and use the ones that make sense to us and are suited for our own use cases. Um, I have two main uh, different approaches we can take for integrating AI into Drupal. The first one is training up uh, ex models that are external to the site. And the second one is augmenting content. So I'll be concentrating on augment content, augmenting content today, but I do want to take you through the, the first approach first, and that is of, of training models. So in this particular scenario, we have Drupal you know, at the center where editors are able to manage their content and use you know, the, the tools that they're familiar with. And uh, in this example here, we're using a, a recommendation engine um, which is external to Drupal, and this is the Recombi recommendation engine. One of the approaches we can take here is to use something like Search API to push that index across over into Recombi, and then Recombi is able to use its own algorithms and smarts to look at you know, that content, work out item similarities, and deliver better results back to the users. And these will come back as, as recommendations to the end users in real time. The key insight here is that we're uh, using Drupal as the source of that information. And in a similar way, we, we can take uh, chatbots as another example. Um, rather than storing the knowledge base external to Drupal, we can uh, have the knowledge base inside. So editors can manage articles and pages, but they can also manage the knowledge base inside Drupal. Um, we're able to use APIs to push that content across into an external system. In this example, we have QuickChat AI, um, which is an AI-powered chatbot, and QuickChat is in turn based on GPT-3. So what happens is you push your knowledge base to QuickChat, QuickChat then pushes that across to GPT-3 and trains up that large language model, and that model is now adapted to your own website. And of course, QuickChat can then serve back conversations to your end users. And what it's doing, it's leveraging the large language model that's in GPT-3, as well as um, pulling in the content from your site. And so you're kind of getting the best of both worlds, a huge pool of knowledge plus your uh, content specific to your site. So I just wanted to yeah, call out a couple of examples there of how we can use Drupal as a source to push data out to an external system and make use of you know, the smarts that are, are there. And the end result is that uh, yeah, content is coming back in real time and improving uh, you know, the user experience. But the second approach, and this is the one I'm focusing on today, is that of augmenting content. And in this world, there are just huge opportunities available to us as owners of websites. For example, uh, we have text. CMSs manage HTML and text, and there's many different ways we're able to augment this content. Firstly, we can classify it, and secondly, we can transform it. So many of these AI services will provide a keyword extraction or tagging, um, entity extraction, which is a little bit more structured, as well as you know, conducting sentiment analysis on content. Is it positive or negative? And there are many ways we can transform the text as well. We can summarize it um, and, and make sort of descriptions. We can generate article ideas and article outlines and even write complete essays if we want to. Um, some of these systems can correct grammar and also do translation. So as you can see, there are a lot of opportunities here. Over in the world of images, it's a similar story. Um, we're able to submit images to external systems, pull back labels or tags. Um, we can also see, uh, you know, are they safe for work? Do they contain nudity or violence? Um, these kinds of uh, you know, metadata can come back and help you know, uh, improve the images in your media library. And in the, on the transformation side of things there, you know, we can extract text out of images and make use of that. And of course, in the DALI 2 example, we can actually convert text to images. In the video world, it's similar to images. If we consider video as a, just a stream of images, we can take similar approaches and use label detection and entity extraction um, with some of these APIs. And in the world of speech, 
we can take a uh, speech in the form of a sound file and convert that into a transcript. And of course, you can imagine this transcript would be really good for um, improving search, improving SEO, and uh, even accessibility as well. And flipping that around, we can actually take the text on a page, maybe the body field, for example, and then we can convert that into uh, you know, the spoken word. And this can be uh, then delivered as a file. So each page on your site could essentially become a little mini audio book, if you will. So yeah, lots and lots of opportunities here. The key insights, it's pretty similar to the, the first one, really. You know, the Drupal is the place where editors are maintaining their content. The smarts are in an external, external system. But here the content is being uplifted, and this will lead to richer and better structured uh, content. Um, the low-hanging fruit here, or the key use cases as I see it, is really you know, extracting keywords and tags, generating summaries, maybe helping writers out who have writer's block, and you know, fixing up grammar mistakes and, and translating content. And on the functionality side of things, I think there's some really big advances that can be made around the media um, library and the media browser. You could imagine uh, you know, content that has been tagged up is really going to help editors find that image. You know, how many of you struggled to find that thumbnail or that image that you wanted to use uh, in an article? Sometimes a media browser just doesn't cut it with you know, searching for a title. Adding these tags in is really going to uplift um, that experience uh, for editors as well. And of course, having that better structure is going to improve discoverability of content. It's also going to improve you know, similarity matches that you may be doing in, in solar or, or other external systems. So yeah, there's a lot of benefits there. Okay, turning to innovation in the Drupal space, just what have we, have we seen here? What uh, sort of tools and approaches are out there? Um, if you take a look at the Drupal presentations that have happened uh, you know, over the last uh, few years, you'll see a lot of interest really starting to pick up around 2017, 2018. And at Drupal Cons, there have been a number of presentations being given. And most of these presentations are around uh, the concepts of keyword extraction and uh, summarization. When I was looking at these, the thing that really struck me is that these are sort of specific solutions for a specific problem using specific APIs. And that is a developer has, has seen an opportunity and scratched an itch, developed some code and, and come up with a nice little solution. And what, but each of these solutions has been different. And so what I thought is, well, wouldn't it be great if we could generalize this and try to build a system you know, to make this sort of easier and, and more reproducible? So let's generalize the approach of getting content into Drupal. So I'd like to introduce the Augmenter module. This is a module we've been working at Morphed uh, over the last sort of month or so. There's nothing quite like conference-led development where you've got that deadline and you've got to get that code out. I'd like to say a big thanks to Elio and Naveen who've been um, working on these uh, modules. It's just been released as a, a dev version uh, in the last day or so. So, how does the Augmenter module work? Well, during my research, I came across another buzzword, and that is of content ops. Um, you know, web ops, dev ops, content ops. Here's the next one. Um, content ops is improving the, the pipeline of producing content and making that more reproducible and easier and timely uh, and basically just you know improving the way content is delivered and basically this concept of an augmenter sort of fits into that model. So here we have an editor doing their work in Drupal and they decide that they want to augment some content. They should be able to click a button and interact with the interface. The augmenter should then be able to go out to an external API, get that data back and then update the UI for the editor. And then the editor, very importantly, at the end, should be able to review that content and you know, accept it or, or reject it. So this is the, the basic flow. Two key things here. Firstly, we can have many different augmenters, so we can connect to different surfaces outside. And secondly, we can update in many different ways as well. So we might want to update in the WYSIWYG, or we might want to um, update you know, via a button on a web form. So yeah, we've taken the generalized approach, we've developed a plugin, we've got different UI integration points for editors, and of course we have a configurable system for site builders. So let's have a look at the Augmenter plugin. This is basically what developers see. It's very, very simple. It just takes a single string, 
trying to keep it as simple as possible. And then Augmenter will then execute that and essentially go off to the remote service and bring back a very simple structure. And in this case, it's a, a keyed array of values. And then we're able to use those values um, to update the, the UI. Uh, let's make it concrete. So we're going to have a look at a GPT-3 completion summary augmenter. So this is using the GPT-3 service from OpenAI. And this system is driven by something called a prompt. And you see the prompt on the right hand side. Summarize for a second grader, and then we have the content that's out of the body field. And what GPT-3 then sends back is a nice little description, uh, which is suitable for, you know, um, you know, meta tag description or, you know, something you might use on a teaser or something like that. So that's sort of an example of some data we can get back from GPT-3. In a very similar way, we can slightly, you know, flip that, change that up, and we can make a keywords uh, prompt for GPT-3. So on the right, we have extract keywords for this text. We can submit the text, and then GPT-3 will send us back an array of um, values. And you can see that these can be used uh, to tag up content. And then using Google Cloud Vision API, we can take a similar approach. This time we're using the file URL of an image. We submit that off to Google, and Google sends us back a nice little array of uh, tags for that image, street, snapshot, town, and night. And of course, this can be used to, to mark up um, images in your uh, media library. So editor workflow, this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. You'll actually see this stuff uh, in action. So for editors, we wanted to um, make augmenters available in a number of different situations. The first one um, is around action buttons on entity forms, or essentially the node edit form. When you're editing a node, editors should be able to click a button. And also in the WYSIWYG, when an editor is in the WYSIWYG, maybe they should be able to select some text and then get some augmentations back. We do have some other items here in the roadmap, mostly based around um, actions that can you know, be done on entities. So for example, bulk operations or node saves and these kinds of things. So we'll be able to implement um, those soon. Um, but yeah, let's go on and, and have a look at some of this stuff in action. So summarizing content. Here I have an article about Jupiter, and I want to add a summary for it. So the editor comes in. It's a very simple little article. I click the edit, and we're now in the edit screen for this particular article. And you can see the body text there. We just scroll down a little bit, and we'll be able to see the button, Summarize GPT-3. So this is firing up the Summarize um, uh, augmenter and the content came back and was written down into that uh, that particular field. Having a look at tagging some content, so here we are have another article. This particular article doesn't have uh, any tags to find for it, so the editor can come in, edit this particular node. We'll get there shortly, and. Um, so yeah, we're going to come down to the tagging section uh, for this particular node. Um, we've just got an autocomplete tags thingy down here, and we're going to generate some tags from GPT-3. So this is using the keywords one. So these keys, keywords come back as an array. They're in the UI like this, and you're able to select the ones that look good, and you can add them in. And once the editor is happy with that, of course, they can save that node and move on with their work. Let's have a look at the WYSIWYG. Let's say I want to write an article on Nikola Tesla and his contributions to technology. I've come up with the title, but I've just got no idea what I'm going to write about. I, I've got writer's block. Now, I mean, this is a little bit more sort of experimental, but basically we can type this into the WYSIWYG, we can select it, and we've got this special little augmenters button here, and we can come down and select the Create essay outline augmenter. And this is using GPT-3 again. And it's going to go back. And with the power of GPT-3, we've now got four, four things here. And you can use those as an outline. I, we've also got a, a, uh, uh, an augmenter there where you can say, write me an essay on this thing. And you can do that uh, as well. Sorry? That's right. Yeah, I've, I have heard. Uh, university students are using 
GPT-3 to actually answer, um, yeah, homework problems and things like that, yes. Okay, and let's have a look at images. So we, we're moving away from GPT-3 now and we're onto Google Cloud Vision uh, API. We have a, a lovely picture there of an autumn scene and we can come in and edit this. Now, in this case, we're going to um, add some image tags. This uh, sort of connection takes a little bit longer. Google's got a little bit more thinking uh, to do on it, but we've sent that image over to Google and it's going to use the, the feature uh, yeah, for um, label detection. And here we have some nice labels coming back, brown, amber, light, and leaf. So that's all pretty helpful. Um, so that's basically, yeah, tagging up some images using the Google Cloud Vision API. Okay, that, that's it for editors. So, you know, that's sort of like the, the highlight of the presentation. But let's not forget about site builders. Let's have a look at what it looks like for them. So because this is a plug-in system, um, we have a, you know, an area of the site where you can come in and create your own augmenters. And the, the cool thing here is you're not just picking an augmenter, but you're actually configuring it. And in the case of something like GPT-3, there's a lot of stuff you can configure. So in this case, we're connecting to OpenAI. We're using the DaVinci engine, which is the most powerful one. We're defining a prompt there. You can see that prompt can be defined in a textual way. And there's a whole bunch of parameters here to fine tune, you know, how much content we want coming back, how variable will that content be. So that's how, you know, we're able to configure um, the augmenters. And of course, each augmenter is going to have its own configuration there. Um, let's have a look at generating the buttons on the node edit form. Uh, in this case, we've got a special augmenter field widget that we've made, and we can embed this into the, um, into the form display. So here we've created one of these guys. Um, and you can see we, for this body field, which is the source, we want to target the social message field. We want to use the summarize augmenter, and we want to give the button this particular name. So this is how we wire it together. It's like, for this source, let's go to this target and use this augmenter, put the button on the screen, all the, all the magic happens. And then down in the WYSIWYG, we've also integrated uh, that in as well. So here we have the rich text uh, editor, and um, the site builder can come into that particular rich text editor, configure that one up, and we've got a nice little uh, vertical tab there where you can pick the augmenters uh, that you want. So um, for this case, we basically put in all the augmenters except for the um, image one. So this is a really nice way to, to you know, uplift the experience when the editor's in the heat of the moment and writing their content. Now, that's the sort of the demo part of the, the presentation uh, done and dusted. Um, time, unfortunately, you know, is catching up with me and I, I have not able to go into too much more detail, but I really would be interested in, you know, talking about this stuff with, with you guys some more if, if you're interested. So tomorrow I'll put together a, an AI and augmenter boff. So if anyone's interested in, in talking about AI or, you know, some of the things you've seen here, please feel free to, to come along. Now, BOF stands for birds of a feather, and that's just where you can basically sit around and talk about things. And downstairs uh, at the cafe and pool bar at, called the Charles, um, we will have a little get together tomorrow if you're interested. Um, so that's a special part of the, the conference that's been put aside for, uh, for doing BOFs. Hope to see you there, and you know, there's lots of cool things to talk about. So, in conclusion, all right, so. We have seen a number of, um, you know, an explosion, really, of powerful tools that are out there. Uh, you know, we have to embrace them. We have to take a composable approach, look at the services that exist, and bring them into our, our sites. Um, I've shown you two ways that you can integrate AI in. The first one is pushing content to an external service, and the second one is basically pulling content in to augment the content that is within Drupal. Now, for website owners, what does this mean for us? Well, firstly, I would say you should be reviewing your users' needs, take a, a user-centered approach and work out which content you know, they may be interested in that they might be missing. But also look at your editor's needs. How can we improve the, the content uh, production workflow for them? And once you've identified those gaps, uh, let's try to fill them. And you can do that by then uh, taking an audit of all the external services and the APIs that are out there. I've only shown you a couple today, but there are many, many more 
uh, that you can plug in. And if, uh, if it suits, you can use a module such as Augmenter uh, to be able to, to integrate those in. The projects I've shown you today here are Quick Chats, Recombi, and Augmenter. These are all open source modules developed at Morphed, which we've uh, released on Drupal.org. And the APIs there, we've, we've got uh, the GPT-3 one. If you haven't tried it out, I recommend you do. Just type in GPT-3 examples. You'll get taken to a little playground. It's very, very fun, and uh, your mind will be blown. And also Google Cloud API, well, Vision, Google Cloud Vision API is the other one we were using for the images. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it. I've uh, really enjoyed putting this conference, this presentation together. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, and I've got time for questions. <laughs> Jenny, yep. You know the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I'm curious about is how accurate you find um, the results from the GPT. Like if, it, if it's gone through a passage of, you, you know what the text on our website is like, so, you know, a horrible big chunk of Mm. information. Um, mm. How good is it at summarizing that? Because that's a bit that just got me really excited. Yes, I mean, that, that's hard to say. I mean, I, I would recommend you go into the, the playground and paste your, you know, paste an article in and see what you can get out, right? That would be, that would be a fun thing to do. Uh, GPT-3 has been trained on, like, basically the whole web and, you know, academic articles and newspapers and all of GitHub and all that. So it's consumed a lot of stuff. It knows a lot of things. Um, but it, it stopped consuming that stuff a few years ago um, now. So it's, it's sort of like a general um, sort of knowledge base and might not be so well suited for a specific uh, use case if you, you know. But, you know, I, I would think it would probably have a reasonable, it would give it a reasonable shot of extracting, extracting you know, knowledge out. So you know, proofs in the pudding, and I would say, yeah, give that a try. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, so we've got the summarize for a second grader, which is a weird one, right? And I have seen, um, so there, there's this, you know, this new job that's out there called, uh, you know, prompt engineer, right? It's like, how can you get the best from these different models? And certainly in the world of DALI 2 and GPT-3, where you are submitting text, it's really down to the skill of the person crafting that text up. So there are some, yeah, you know, summarize for a second grader. And there are, I have seen ones that say rewrite this text. So you might be able, there is an example like rewrite this in the first person or rewrite it in the third person. And you could say, you know, I'm a really sort of funny, crafty individual. Re rewrite it like I'm talking to someone at a party and then give it the text. That's how crazy it is. So who knows? Maybe you could simplify it for plain language. And uh, that's just the power of, I'm a bit of a fanboy at GPT-3, but it, it, it's just amazing what you can do. So I would say give that a try and uh, see what you come up with. Yeah. Um, so regarding the um, creating an article um, my understanding is that it doesn't have any understanding of like what's factual and what isn't. So, like, if you ask it to make an article and it just creates a bunch of plausible sounding lies, is that something that you've been found able to be um, happening in your when you use that functionality? Or well, I mean, it, 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 just we're talking about GPT three specifically. Yeah. Like, so it's it's consumed like all of Wikipedia and all the web. So you can ask a very factual questions and it will answer those and you know some of the examples I'm seeing you know it's like you know I have been influenced by this philosopher this philosopher this philosopher what is the meaning of life and it gives an amazing answer so I, I would not underestimate you know what it what it can do but can if you deliver it lies what what is it going to do so open AI is very particular about the use cases for it and if you start you know doing stuff that's a little bit off color or, or weird it will say hey this is not really an appropriate Use so it, you know, so there may be some boundaries there that you may not be able to, to go into. Well, I meant more like um, technical specific fields, like you'd have it do like a regulation, it might get a regulation wrong. Yeah, um, so like having it write, write an article on like 66 of the civil aviation sure. regulation, sure, it might say that it was written by the FAA or by 
traveling in the bank. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I haven't gone into it here, but one of the things you can do is you can train the GPT-3 model. Mod, um, model. Um, so with a quick chat example, we were taking the knowledge base and that gets sent over as a file and it essentially sits on top of the knowledge base. And when you're querying GPT-3, it's then got all that information. So you could potentially feed a not, and I haven't, we haven't implemented this, but you could easily implement a system that took content in Drupal, put it across into GPT, retrained that model, and then you're querying against that updated model. So you could then have potentially have that real information in there, and then you could summarize that, and you'd actually be getting domain-specific information coming out of that. Yeah. Are you familiar with any um, AI tool for video where um, you know you would run a video through and would index um, you know parts of the video that this at this minute it is talking about this topic and at that minute it's talking about something else? Yeah, so I mean Google Cloud Vision they've got a, a video version of that. I haven't really looked into that, but they will do entity extraction so they might say yeah a bicycle appears at one minute 20 i'm, I'm just guessing i'd have a time stamped i haven't looked into that but maybe have a look at the google whatever it is you know video one and just see what you can get out of that but i know that they can do entity extraction from from video and as well i don't want to keep talking about google and open ai there's a number of other services out there where you could probably do similar things Thanks. yeah Uh, those examples that you gave, uh, we had a text, and then you went and retrieved tags. From that. Yeah, that seemed so quite quick compared to, to the, the image one. You know, yeah, that's the difference. Were they cached at all, or were they going? Out no, no, that was that was real. That was real time from yeah, um, GPT three. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that wasn't that wasn't fake. I, I think like Google's got to get the image and process it, and that's probably you know the algorithms for you know decomposing that are, are going to be. I, don't, I guess, you know, harder to, to do, so. Uh, yeah, but I was impressed with the time. That's right, yeah, that, that was that was for real. That was for real, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, that's right, yeah. I, look, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, like, when you went, if you go back to Drupal 7 days, there were just a huge explosion of all these integrations that were were around a lot of you know tagging and descriptions and you know that was sort of like the first generation and somewhere between seven and eight those modules never came across right and so it's like you know with folksonomy and the the, the the development of you know tagging and all that concept that was really taking off around 2000 that was hot back then and it just seemed it never really crossed over into to Drupal 8 and if you you know look at those old modules they don't really seem to be flourishing in you know this new Drupal nine world, so that's you know that's why we sort of you know had a look at doing this. But when I reviewed the landscape, there just wasn't really sort of much that was sort of going on there. There were cool some of the projects that were trying to use that the key problem because it could provide a little bit of and you get uh, text language, and then it will try and give you tags that you can use. And so we get a problem with that is that it would give you too many tags and. They were uh, they were able to sort of correctly identify the subject domain that you were talking about. Right. And so it would start giving tags back that were not really about the thing that you were mm. talking about. Mm. And there's often like the ambiguity of using a common word between different domains of, of language. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. that something you see like these newer forms of AI being able to address? Yes. Yeah, kind of difference in context. That's really interesting. I mean, obviously, GPT three is just sending back the strings. Um, and in the, the version of the, the images that were coming back, they're just giving you strings as well. But there are other APIs out there that will give you, well, firstly, I will say on the image one, you can set a minimum score. So Google will give you, give it a, a score, like, you know, make it, make it over 0.7. So it will sort of give you a, a certainty kind of value. So you can improve, you know, make sure there's a threshold that it gets to. And in the case of the entity extraction ones, which are much more structured, Google will go through and say, you know, this is a company, this is a, a place, this is a whatever. So they're not just pulling out 
um, strings are actually pulling out entities with, you know, an identity, maybe, you know, in Wikipedia or whatever. So there are, yeah, these tools out there are, are much more structured in, in some ways. So I guess you can take your pick from those different services. And I think there'll be, you know, uh, a presentation tomorrow on that Google Natural Language Processing uh, API as well, which, you know, is, is doing that energy extraction stuff. 